The next uh, presenter is Geraldine McElhenney, a social worker from Galway. Um, medical social worker in Galway University, working as part of a neurology team, graduated in NUI, Galway. Used to be there many, many years ago myself with an arts degree in public and social policy and from Trinity College in 2005 with a master's in social work. She has worked in several hospital settings and Geraldine's role today would include connecting patients and families to necessary so, uh, resources and supports in the community, providing support and grief um, counselling and helping patients to expand and strengthen their network um, of social supports. Today she will discuss the entitlements a person with Parkinson's disease can apply for. Okay, so thank you so much. And then we're going to have a, a question and answer session with Geraldine and Suzanne at the end, if that's okay. Okay, thank you so much. That's okay. How are we doing? Is that okay? That's perfect, yeah. Okay, and it's, it's this one here. Yeah, you got Fantastic. it. Fantastic. All right. Lovely. Thank you very no much. Sorry about that. Um, so my name's Geraldine and I'm a social worker in Galway University Hospital and I work as part of the neurology team there. And I suppose what I wanted to talk to you today about were a number of different kind of entitlements that people might be entitled to, they mightn't be aware of, and then different supports that might be available to them in, um, in, in the community and services that they might be able to access. So I suppose the things I wanted to touch on today would be, first of all, really what my job would be in a hospital setting and then what we might do is we might look at sorry I'll just get it there we go we might look at medical cards GP visit cards the drug payment scheme uh, the long-term illness scheme um, a payments for the individual themselves who has a diagnosis and then um, so, um, allowances and benefits that would also be available to their carers and then we might look at the support services that are available for people under the age of 65 and those available for people over the age of 65 and then we'll also look at grants that can be made available through um, housing corporations and county councils. So I suppose my job really as a social worker is to support people who are in a hospital setting. And normally anyone who comes into a hospital setting is in some level of crisis, um, whether it's individually or it's with regard to the illness. And I suppose when we get involved, it's where the social and the emotional problems are affecting their um, ability to be discharged from hospital and the ability to manage um, what's happening to them. So we might be able there to help kind of restore balance for people. And I suppose um, w the way we would do it is we would normally do a social assessment and we'd look at the psychological factors and the different environmental factors um, that influence why a person is in hospital. And I suppose as a, a medical social worker, my job is really to hear your voice. Um, in a hospital setting, obviously there's a lot of medical talk there's a lot of people coming and going to your bedside on a daily basis and it's really my job to hear where you're coming from and how you're feeling about things and what you want because at the end of the day you're the person that knows yourself best you're the decision maker and it's our role to really hear what you're saying to us so I want to start with medical cards if that's okay to qualify for a medical card you must um must um satisfy a means assessment and that means that there must be a certain income threshold for you and your family. So the things that are taken in, into consideration would be your savings, any investments you have, any second properties, not your home but any other properties that you might be renting out or you might own could also be taken into consideration. If you're over 70 years of age 
if you're on social welfare entitlement, and my next slide will show it a bit better, um, if you're on social welfare entitlements or HSE allowances and you will go over the threshold, you still should be entitled to a medical card and it's based on those levels. So for a single person, this is for people over 70 years of age, for a single person who is a widow or widower not, or not married uh, or not cohabiting, um, your threshold should be under 500 euros. So that would take into consideration any HSC um, allowance you might be receiving and then any social welfare payment you might be receiving. And then it also takes into consideration other things like if you are renting out a property, those kinds of things. If it's a couple, it's below 900 for both of you together. And what happens is when you fill out the application uh, uh, form for a medical card, it's actually the medical card and the GP application form is all in one. And if you're above the threshold, what they do is they automatically then send your application for a GP visit card instead. So if you're above the initial thresholds of 500 and 900, then what they're looking at is over 500, not over 700 for an individual person for a GP visit card, and then over 900, but not over 1,400 for a couple together. For, for medical cards, there are assessments for both under 70s and over 70s. And with the over 70s, as I've just shown there, the thresholds are higher than those for people under what they call the 60, uh, age 66 and under. And the reason that is, is because they take other allowances into consideration. You might have a dependent child, you might be a carer for somebody else, so other monies can also be taken into consideration. Um, also, as you, as you be aware, medical cards can be awarded on other grounds, such as discretionary grounds. Um, also, if you have a medical card, there are other additional benefits. So if you have children, there'd be uh, free school uh, transport for children living three or more miles from the school. There'd be exemption from examination fees in public secondary schools and financial assistance with school books. Also, they also would always re review things when um, you might be considering to return to work if you've been um, out for a period of time or if you're moving house. I think one of the key things we see in hospital settings is often people lose their medical cards and what happens is they're sent out a review form. They think, I have a medical card, I don't need to fill it in and they don't send it back. And next thing they get is a notice saying your medical card has been cancelled and then they have to go through the whole process again. So I think one of the key things we see say to people is if you're moving house it really is your responsibility to let the medical card section know because they won't take responsibility for it so it's really important because that's one of the things we do see a lot of people coming into hospital with very stressed out have lost their medical cards and in this day and age unfortunately there really isn't any emergency medical cards like they used to be so when you do apply again even though the process should take 15 working days realistically we see that it takes six to ten weeks and I think that that's a lot of pressure on an individual so one of the things I would definitely be recommending, if it's all right with yourselves, is it's really important that if you, when you do get those review letters, to send back the, the, the forms straight away. The retention of the medical card, then, is to do with... Often when somebody returns to work, if they're maybe um, a single parent or they're trying to explore the possibility of going back to work, even on a part-time basis, they're afraid that they'll lose their medical card. But with the medical card... At certain thresholds, there can be the retention of it, so the keeping of it for up to three years after you go back to work. So I think that that's very important for people to be aware of as well, because sometimes people aren't aware of that. And again, as I just mentioned there, if you don't um, qualify for the medical card, you'll also automatically be put forward to apply for the GP visit card. Uh, visit card. And uh, that's, that's that bit there. So... Other than that, then, there would be the drug payment scheme. And I, I, I would think that most people would know that, especially be having a pharmacist in the room. But um, an individual or a family uh, would pay a maximum of €144 Euros a month for approved medications and appliances. And I think the important thing then is, as well, is to be using the one pharmacy. Um, what we would often see in Galway City is people might be using one or two different pharmacies, and it's hard then for them to get their benefits. So it's important, if possible, to try and use the same pharmacy, or at least have the pharmacies communicating among themselves. The other thing is, 
if you are not eligible for a medical card, you can apply for a long-term illness card. And that would mean that if, once that is awarded to you, the medications that are to do with your Parkinson's would then be free of charge to you. So other medications, if you have other um, uh, comorbidities, other uh, diagnosis, they wouldn't be covered, but the, the medications you would need to do with your Parkinson's would be covered in that way. I want to move on, if that's okay, to um, individual allowances that would be available to you. Um, all these uh, the applications for disability allowance, you can apply through welfare.ie on, on the website, you can print it off there, or a lot of people will often go into the, the local CICs, the Citizens Information Centres, and you can get the application forms there as well. So disability allowance, is, it's a means-tested assessment, and the criteria is that you be expected to have the diagnosis for at least one year. So with Parkinson's, that does qualify you for that. And it, it means that you would be substantially restricted in being able to undertake the work um, that you would have been previously doing. And then when you turn 66, then you no longer um, qualify for it, and they'll send you out information to tell you now to apply for a state pension, or sometimes, if they're very nice, they might send you out the application form. And to apply for that, you must satisfy the habitual residency condition. So that must mean that you live in Ireland and intend to live in Ireland and have uh, the rights of an, uh, an Irish status. Illness benefit might be paid for people who were working, have recently got a diagnosis, and now are unable to work um, for a period of time. There is, um, the application can be made available uh, through the GP surgery. The GP would sign off on your application and that would go on a weekly basis into the social welfare office. Um, you must apply within the se first seven days of um, becoming ill, but often when it's a diagnosis such as that you've been in a hospital, um, there is understanding around it. And normally you'd get a, a letter from your consultant neurologist giving the, your recent diagnosis. Um, and then what would happen is then on a weekly basis after that, or in some circumstances, a monthly basis, you would send in an applica um, a, a sick cert, per se, to the social welfare office. And to qualify, there are two different con conditions. You must have at least 104 weeks PRSI contributions made since you started work. And these would either be 39 weeks paid in the last two years or 26 weeks paid in the relevant tax year. So say, for instance, we're now in 2015. If it was the last two years, it would mean 2000, the, last, the, the first part of 2015, all of 2014, and a little bit of 2013. If you didn't have that, what they would look at is they'd actually go back from 2013 two years and try and make up the contributions over over those two year periods sorry it sounds a little bit complicated but it is a lot easier when you're filling out the applications um, if you worked abroad a lot of people might have worked in England or America or other countries um, they might look at a combination of your um, monies there together and illness benefit then is paid for a maximum of two years um, if you have the full amount of contributions which would be 260 weeks of social insurance or if you have one uh, or it'll be paid for one year which is 312 days if you've had between 104 and 259 weeks of social insurance contributions since you first started so they'll pay for one full year if you have part contributions and they'll pay for the two full years if you have more than that. And again, before the payment would stop, they would normally contact you and let you know that the, the period of time, because it's from your own contributions, this is coming. Um, so they would let you know and they'd let you know of the other options which would be available. So it may be invalidity if you're going to continue working off your PRSI contributions. It might be disability allowance, which we spoke about earlier, which would be the means tested um, allowance. It might be a basic supplementary welfare allowance if you don't satisfy the criteria for the, for the others. Or if you're aged over 66, we'd be looking at the pension. 
Now, sometimes what happens is people who have a diagnosis and then feel that they're managing quite well with medication um, might feel that they want to return to some nature of work, but realize that they can't work in the way that they used to previously. And this is where they might apply for what's called a partial capacity benefit. Um, and what would happen is you would go to see your consultant neurologist. You would ask them to write a letter to explain the nature of your diagnosis. So if it's mild, moderate, severe, or profound. And then based on that, you would make an application to the social welfare office, complete the application, and then they get their assessor together with the information they've received from the consultant to decide how much um, of a benefit you would receive. In this way, what would happen is, say for instance, you decided you wanted to work and you were working maybe as a journalist, which was like part-time work and it might be infrequent. If you were um, seen as having um, a severe um, diagnosis, what would happen is it works out mild is 25%, Moderate is 50%, severe is 75%, and profound is 100%. So if you were seen as having a severe level of uh, diagnosis, which means that it does impede every day on your ability to work, but that you want to work, then what would happen is you would get 75% of your payment, and then all monies you would receive from working um, would then just be, um, would be your monies, um, but obviously it would be taxed. So that's what some people um, feel that they would like to do because, again, it just feel, it makes them feel that they want to get back into to doing some of the things that were very important to them. With this, you would keep your household benefits. Um, if you live on an island, your island benefits, you'd know I'm from Galway because a lot of people live on islands near us. And you would keep your free travel, but you would lo lose your free, uh, free fuel allowance and your living alone allowance. So they would be two of the allowances that you would lose. Um, if it's okay then, I'm going to move on to carers, because um, I think that carers are very important as well, and sometimes people aren't aware of what might be available to them um, in, in the caring role. So carer's allowance is a means-tested payment to a person looking after um, a loved one who, who would have a, a diagnosis. And if you're receiving other social welfare payments, you might be entitled to a half carer's allowance. You mightn't get a full carer's allowance, but you might get a half carer's allowance. And if you were caring for two people as well as working uh, for a period of time, then you might get two half carers allowances because often it might be one person in a household looking after two other people. But there are certain criterias that you have to satisfy uh, with regards to working because it would be seen that your role would be to support someone. So you are allowed to work outside of the house, but not for a, a substantial amount of time. Other entitlements then you would also be able to get would be the free household uh, benefits, and that would be um, your TV license and so many units of either electricity or, electricity or gas. You wouldn't get the, the free uh, phone uh, line rental is gone now, or the mobile phone credit, so we, that isn't there anymore. You'd also get a free travel pass in your own right, and you would also get a respite care grant. And at the moment, that's €1,375, and that's paid in June of every year, normally the second week in June, and that's just a contribution as well um, towards helping that if, if you're in a caring role and you um, might possibly be trying to organise something, but you're caring for somebody and you know that that person needs to be supported too, that money can be used to either um, buy in other care to support them or maybe to help uh, towards the cost of a nursing home, or sometimes people use it for a little breakaway together and they use the money to, to spend on a little holiday. Um, a carer's benefit then is uh, paid to a person who leaves work to care for their loved one. And the carer's benefit can be paid up to a total of 104 weeks for each person that you're caring for. Um, obviously, you have to um, apply for um, through your employer as well for the uh, possibility to do this. Um, I think what's really important is even if you don't get carer's benefit, so say you apply for it, but maybe you don't get it or you don't get carer's allowance, you still are entitled to get a respite care grant. And I think a lot of people aren't always aware of that. So we always say to people, if you're in that caring role and you're caring for a loved one and maybe you, you choose not to apply for a carer's allowance or a carer's benefit, you still have that right to apply for respite care grants. So it's very important to do so. 
Um, also, a person might apply for a period of time out of work, um, carer's leave, and that would be unpaid time out of work, which is when people often apply for the carer's benefit, and that would be to provide care for their loved one. And your job is meant to be held open for you. Um, it might be that you are working in a setting such as my own, where you would be told... Um, if you do leave the job you're in, there is the possibility that specific job wouldn't be held open for you, but another job in the same area would be held open for you, so you wouldn't lose your, 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 your post. If it's okay then, I just want to link in with regards to services available for under 65s and services available for over 65s. Now, I suppose what we often see is the services available for people under 65 are quite limited and that's really why services like the Parkinson's associations are so important because um, the, the level of services on the ground at the moment for people under 65 are quite limited. Um, through disability services, um, some people might have um, a PA, a personal assistant, and that would be somebody to help you keep your independence. That's really what their role is. So normally what would happen is you would make an application through your local health, health office to... Um, the disability case manager. They would either ring you up if you're able to, to talk to them on the phone if you feel confident, or they come out and visit you. They would see the level of supports that you might need, and then they would try and fund that and maybe link you in with services um, in the disability sector, or if you're looking for a service like a, a personal assistant, they would organize somebody like that for you. They're also the person that would organize kind of case meetings uh, with regards to care packages for people. and. Um, it, it's really important that if you are looking for services that you do link in with them because they would be the main the main point of um, a services for people under 65. Um, I'm aware that home health services as well are often available for people under the age of uh, 65, but it's a discretionary service. So it's not always available in every area. But what we would often say is ask your public health nurse. Your, your, your local public health nurse is going to know what's available in your own area. So it's really important to link in with them. For people over the age of 65, home help services available. And that is um, help with day-to-day -day tasks. Um, now often, um, it used to be that they would be able to help with a range of different services. So it might have been that they were able to help with personal care, with household tasks. It seems now, with the with the cuts and resources, it seems to be more based around house, um, around personal care. So if you need assistance with personal care, with dressing, also with things like kind of making your bed, day-to-day -day tasks that you might be finding a bit more difficult, that's really what the support is there for. Um, and really their role is to help you stay at home to help keep that independence and, and avoid having to link in with services such as long-term care if that's not what you're you're hoping to do. The service is generally free to medical card holders and if you're not in a hospital setting you can apply for it through your public health nurse. Um, then the next level of service for home help, that tends to be kind of between one and seven to maybe 10 hours a week. So that might be that somebody might be coming into an hour to an hour and a half a day, Monday to, it's normally they start Monday to Friday, and then if the service is needed more, they might uh, provide it Saturday and Sunday. If you feel that you need more than that, you might need somebody coming in in the morning, maybe again at lunchtime, and maybe again a little bit of support in the evening. That's what they call a home care package. And that service is really to help people who have medium to high levels of support care needed and the um, the service is really it, it varies so when you're applying for it what happens is the GP gets involved the public health nurse gets involved if you're in a hospital setting it'll be the physiotherapist and the occupational therapist together with the social worker that will make the application and really the application is to kind of give a, a holistic look at what your levels of need are what you actually want yourself and then to see what services can be put in place um, again if you're not in a hospital setting either the public health nurse or the, the GP would be able to to start that application for you um, we don't really see home care packages too much for people under the age of 65 but you can apply for it if somebody has um, a diagnosis where they have some level of confusion with their diagnosis um, in the sense of if they um, maybe have um, a diagnosis of a type of dementia or Alzheimer's you can also apply for a home care package the home care package, um, really, the, the, 
the way they look at it is your ability to carry out activities of day living, your ADLs. So they might be looking at getting up in the morning. Do you need one person to help you? Do you need two people to help you? Um, maybe you use a hoist, so you would need two people, to, a full hoist. Maybe you'd need two people to help you with that. They also look at what services are already there. So who's already involved in your care? And they also look at what level of family support or friends might be available to help you. And that's often where they'll look at if somebody's already in receipt of maybe a carer's allowance or carer's benefit. And again, most important, what do you want? What are your wishes? And what would you like and dislike? So maybe you'd like to have um, a, a female carer or a male carer. They try and adapt to your, your needs as much as possible. The other option then sometimes that we see is people are now looking at look long-term care. And it's, it's where they feel that they're no longer really able to be um, cared for in their own home. I think what's really important with the decision to look at long-term care is, is it's the person's own decision. Um, often we can say um, it's, it's the best thing, we're not going to be able to cope, we can't manage their care needs anymore. But I know that in the hospital settings, when a geriatrician is involved, very much key to them is what does the individual want? What are their wishes? And are they agreeable with it? And I suppose that really kind of is, is about the, the, the criteria that you have to meet to apply for it. So there are three steps to um, applying for the fair deal or long-term care. The first step of it is a care needs assessment, which is where a geriatrician would see a person either in a hospital setting or as an outpatient and decide together with the person whether long-term care is the best option for them. And to look at that, they're looking at all those things we, we've talked about previously, um, their ability to manage independently, um, what their wishes are, the home supports that they have or haven't got. All of these things are crucial to help the geriatrician make the decision. Um, often you might have somebody being queried with regards to their capacity, but I know that with the consultants they would feel that it's very important that the person themselves is being heard and they would find it very difficult to make a decision not, uh, sorry, to put somebody into a nursing home setting if it's not what the person wishes for themselves. It's only done in very extreme uh, measures where, where capacity is really being questioned and often in those situations um, people might have to explore things like ward of court because it really is important and especially with the new bills that are coming out with regards to older people that the person is at the centre of things in their decision making. The second part of it then is the application for state support. So that is basically the fair deal application form. That's the financial form that you yourself would fill out. Um, the individual can fill it out or a family member can fill it out and it takes into consideration um, your home, um, it takes into consideration any lands you have, um, any rental properties again or additional incomes and also any savings. So savings for an individual is is um it's ca capped at 36,000. So if you have savings over 36,000, that's taken into consideration, but not if you have savings under that. If you are a couple, it's over 72,000. So again, it's it, it's doubled because it takes into consider uh, consideration both people. And then if your house and the house and land is then valued uh, over a three-year period. And the way it works, again, is for an individual, it would be at 7.5%. And then if you're, again, if it's a couple, it's at three and three quarters uh, percent because it takes into consideration that there would be another person living in the house afterwards. Some people then decide that they don't want to look at the financial side of things at that time, and they might pl apply for ancillary state support. And that is where they actually take out a loan from the HSC. Um, and they agree that at the end of um, the, their time in a nursing home, that um, basically between the HSE and the family then, that the, the, the bill will be managed. I think that that's where people sometimes get quite concerned because, again, in the past, it would have been talk about, you know, 
are they going to take my house? Are they going to take my land? Those kinds of things. People get very worried about those kinds of things. I suppose it's really important. There's a nursing home section in each county, and the, the people there are very good at helping you understand, um, with regards to the fair deal, what your contribution would be. You can apply for it and still not want to proceed with it, but still then have an understanding of what your contribution would be. So that can be very helpful. Also, the application itself needs to be signed by the person who is applying for it. Again, it will only be taken into consideration by another person if that person is, has diminished capacity or really isn't in a position to make a decision for themselves. I think one of the things that really is important um, to me in a, in a hospital setting is often when people are in, in hospital, they can be, can be confused at times, but it's important that you know yourself what you want and you know the decisions that you want to make and I think that it's really important that we never know when we might get confused and it can be really helpful if if you actually apply for what's called an enduring power of attorney and that's where you would meet with the solicitor together with somebody that you feel would act in your best interest and make decisions about what you want in your life in, in, relation, in relation to financial uh, situations, in, re in relation to your home, those kinds of things, ideas that you would have about what's important because if your capacity diminished in any way, it would be very important that your decisions are held. And with an enduring power of attorney, the only way then decisions would be made on your behalf is if a, cons if a consultant or a medical doctor certifies that you no longer have capacity. So then somebody else can make a decision on your behalf. But if you, um, if you go into a hospital setting and sometimes you don't, um, you don't have an enduring power of attorney uh, and you, you do have confusion and it can be very hard for your loved ones and for yourself to understand what's in your best interest. And I think it's just important sometimes that people are aware of that enduring power of attorney. So just to move on to the different kinds of grants that can be available. Um, if you have a disability, you can apply through the County Council for a housing adaptation grant. And then they have three different levels. People who are terminally ill or fully dependent, people who need assistance with ADLs, or people who are independent, but it's really to improve their quality of life. So the application is normally made through the local county council, and then you would normally link in with a, an occupational therapist, and also maybe they would ask for, at that stage, a builder or two builders to send in tenders, quotes for um, for the works, and then based on the, the, that information, they would um, inform you whether you're entitled to a grant. The other type of grant is a mobility aids grant scheme, and that's really to address mobility problems in the home. So it might be looking at things like grab rails, level uh, access showers, and ramps or maybe stair lifts in the home. Um, the grant is available to people with a maximum household income of less than 30,000. Um, and again, they normally would look for an, an OT, to an occupational therapist to link in with regards to that. The last one I have is with regards to housing aids for older people. And that is really to improve the condition of an older person's home. Sometimes maybe the windows or the doors or the house just needs maybe insulation, things like that. And again, you can apply for that. And it's, it's seen in terms of genuine hardship so that you, you wouldn't have the financial means to be able to pay for the works, but the works really need to be done um, in your home. You can link in with the local authorities with regards to that. And normally there is a social worker working in each of the, the, um, the housing uh, departments in the county council so if you have any difficulties you can ask to speak to the social worker um, especially if you want to talk privately about any of these issues um, I hope that was helpful and thank you very much <laughs> Geraldine, thank you so much. Would, would you mind taking a little seat up here? I'll tell, I'll tell you what, guys, we're running a little bit tight on time, so I'm going to ask Geraldine and Suzanne, would they mind just hanging on here at the stage? And if anybody would like to come up and ask some questions of the two ladies, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to, uh, to help. Would that be okay?